welcome to 2022. This year marks Ireland's 100th year as an independent nation. And birthdays are a good time for reflection, don't you think? How well have we done? How far have we come? In Ireland's case, the answer is very far indeed. Ireland has not only taken her place amongst the nations of the world, she's taken her place amongst the leading nations of the world. Let me show you how. Some film of life in Ireland in the 1920s recently came to light. Film in Cork and Kerry, you might have seen it in RTE or on the news. It was filmed by an American, Benjamin Galt, who came over and rediscovered recently in the basement of the Chicago Academy of Sciences. It's fascinating to see it, but in truth, there's little to be nostalgic about here when you think about life in Ireland in the 1920s. In fact, today, Ireland is the second best place to live on the planet. According to the United Nations, second only to Norway, joint second with Switzerland, and in fact, we've made greater progress than any other developed nation in terms of our quality of life over the last 30 years. When the UN first started tracking things, we were 23rd, now second. Yet this is not the impression created by the daily news cycle. I've written, in fact, an optimist guide to Ireland at 100 to provide context, to provide balance, to show the evidence of our positive progress and to explore some of the psychological biases that can blind us to it and make it difficult to accept. Selected by the Irish Times as one of their books of the year, I'm going to share with you some of the exceptional progress Ireland has made in recent decades and why I believe we achieved it. The United Nations look at three buckets of indicators in assessing quality of life. First of these is longevity and health. Do people in the country live long and healthy lives? Well, the Irish now live to 82 years of age on average. It's only two years less than the world's longest livers, the Japanese. We've added 25 years a whole generation to our lives over the last century. We eat healthier than ever, we drive safer than ever, our workplaces are less dangerous than ever, and importantly, we've eliminated some of the leading diseases of 100 years ago. Tuberculosis was the number one killer in the 20s. Bronchitis was number three. Whoop, whooping cough, measles, diphtheria, typhoid. Appendicitis was the top 20 killer. We've eliminated all of that. Public health spending has increased 14-fold over the last 50 years. So in today's terms, in the 1970s, we were spending less than 350 euros per man, woman, and child in the country in healthcare. Today, that figure exceeds 3,500. The number of hospital treatments has doubled in the last 20 years alone. Is it any surprise, therefore, that the Irish consider themselves the healthiest people in Europe? Now, you might be able to see all the detail on that slide, but the important thing is 84% of Irish people say that their health is good or very good, and it's the highest anywhere in Europe. The second basket of indicators that the United Nations look at is education. Do people have the ability to fulfill their personal potential to contribute to the development of society? Well, participation in second level education has increased markedly. From seven in 10 kids completing their leaving certs in the 1980s to more than nine in 10 today. In terms of quality of education, pupil to teacher ratios have never been better. Those with special educational needs in particular are having their needs met like at no previous time in the state's history. But perhaps most importantly of all, we now have one of the most highest educated adult populations in the world. When I completed my BA in psychology in 1991, only 13% of working age adults had a higher education qualification. That figure today is 51%. That's a remarkable transformation and an investment in the potential of the Irish people that has delivered huge dividends for the country. The final bucket that the UN looks at is personal income. Do people have the financial means to look after themselves and their families throughout their long lives? Well, what a tale this graph tells. Ireland's GDP per capita hugely lagged that of the UK and the US from the state's foundation right up to the Kelter Tiger era in the mid 19s. Within just 10 years, we overtook the UK and matched the US. We now exceed the US. Now, the UN uses GNP rather than GDP in its well-being calculations. There are still some multinational corporate earnings in GNP. We don't mind those. But if we strip those out entirely, then Ireland is still ranked seventh or eighth in the world in the UN rankings. And you know what? That is a perfectly brilliant result for me for our first century. But that economic growth has paid real dividends. It has delivered real tangible employment for the country. We had just over a million people in employment from the foundation of the state right up to the Celtic Tiger. 
That figure then doubled in 15 years to over 2 million. Great recession, knocked that back a bit, but we had fully recovered by 2019 to reach new heights. And the nature of those jobs has changed. In the mid 80s, the smallest share was high skill jobs. Now it's the largest share. Only two in 10 jobs in Ireland today are considered low skilled. Unsurprisingly, perhaps therefore, our earnings have grown sharply. We now earn five times more than our grandparents did in real terms. And unlike elsewhere, income inequality in Ireland is in decline. 2019 was the lowest level of inequality on record. And it's lower here than elsewhere. It's below the EU average, and it's well below the level seen in the UK and the US currently. So given the remarkable progress, are we not a very contented people? Well, today's 24-hour news cycle maybe doesn't give you that impression. I explore in my book the psychological biases that result in us looking to the, the negative in the short term rather than to the positive and the long term. But the Irish are, in fact, a happy lot. 95% of Irish people said they were fairly or very satisfied with their lives before COVID struck. In the most recent EU survey of happiness, the Irish topped the poll. 97% of us agreeing or strongly agreeing that we are happy with our lives. So how have we achieved such remarkable success? Why have we outperformed every other developed nation in improving our quality of life in recent decades? What, in other words, has helped Ireland's flower to flourish? Well, I've identified four factors. Firstly, stability. We are one of only a dozen countries that has been consistently democratic throughout the past century. That's enabled us to develop strong and well-functioning institutions of state. We've also, ha we've also had consistent policy direction, no swings to the extreme left or the extreme right, and this ensured we built up a good supply of institutional capital. Secondly, our strength of community. We have high levels of interpersonal trust, we've deep community roots, we're a small country with a political system that keeps our public representatives close to the people. We don't have a strong elite or them versus us mentality. And that has meant that we've genuinely sought to develop a fairer society as our wealth has increased. We have high reserves of social capital in Ireland. And onto that fertile soil, we add the powerful stimulant of education. Our consistent investment in education to such a high level for so many people has helped us develop a reservoir full of human capital. Then we added to this the magic of openness. As a small island with a history of emigration, we were arguably more open to what was happening around us than many other nations. But our increased openness in recent decades has enabled the Irish to shine on the world stage, has opened us up to inward investment, has seen us welcome in the international talent that we've needed to flourish, and the global competition has been good for us. It's these four factors working synergistically that have enabled us to fulfill our potential on the world stage. Now, we don't live in a utopia, of course. When you're ranked number two in the world, there's not much room for further growth. Holding on to that position is the challenge facing us. And as we enter our second century, there are many challenges that we must overcome to continue to improve the quality of life for our citizens. One thing that we simply did not appreciate for most of our first century was that we were burning our reservoirs of natural capital. Ireland is the third worst in Europe in carbon emissions per person. With high incomes come high costs. Ireland is unfortunately the second most expensive place to live in Europe today. And clearly that's a challenge to attract a new talent and the investment that we need. We also know well here there's a housing shortage. We've done well to deliver 20,000 homes last year and the year before during COVID. But still, that's well short of the 35, maybe up to 50,000 that we need annually. And I see that as a threat to our social cohesiveness and our strength of community if we can't meet the reasonable expectations of our large segment of our society, that is threatened. Lastly, for today, I'd highlight the stark reduction in government funding for higher education. Government investment decreased over the Great Recession while student numbers continued to grow. So per student, we're now investing only 50% of what we did back in 2008. Our third level educations are beginning to slip down the global rankings. Given how critical this has been to our national success, it's cutting off our nose to spite our face if we don't reverse the decline soon. So we've achieved a lot, but can we successfully overcome those challenges to hold on to our second place global, global ranking? Well, to successfully do so, I think, firstly, we need to reflect factfully on what we've achieved. 
data-driven, evidence-based approach to our future strategy is essential. We need to understand what got us here. That is the source of our competitive advantage. And we need to nurture these foundations to successfully address the challenges ahead. That's building and supporting that growth of institutional capital, of social capital, of human capital, retaining our open disposition, and increasingly redressing our natural capital imbalance too. But the truth is we've never been healthier, we've never been wealthier, we've never been better educated. There is no generation before us that has been better placed to take this country forward. So spread the good word. Let's balance the overly negative news cycle with evidence-based optimism for what we can achieve. You all have a part to play. I end my book with a quote I found in a study of global optimism across 142 countries. The author concluded, the most optimistic people in the world may be young, economically secure, educated women in Ireland. Well, we've never had more of them. We should be entirely optimistic that we can face the challenges that arise as we enter our second century. Ladies and gentlemen, let's keep progressing. Buy a copy of the book online now to find out more. Thank you for your time today and the very best of luck with the rest of the event. Thank you.